Hello and welcome to my dissertation defense. This is going to be a re-recording. I'm basically trying to make this as close to the talk that I gave when I actually defended it as possible. There were a lot of people who wanted to see the talk but couldn't make it uh, when I gave it live and a lot of people on YouTube and stuff wanted to just see this and I, I wanted a personal record in case I ever wanted to go back and see what, I, what my talk looked like so many years ago. So uh, the title of my talk is Computational Methods for Optical Design. This talk is going to be pretty technical and I'm planning on making follow-up videos kind of explaining uh, these topics kind of at a higher level so people can understand them more but I will also be linking all of the papers that these this talk is based on so if you want to read along or read more in depth of the things I'm talking about uh, you can do that and if you can't get access to a paper email me and I'll send it to you so yeah let's get into it so the outline of my talk is you can see why uh, the talk is kind of generic there's so many different things I've worked on here. So we're going to start with an introduction to geometric optics, explaining uh, what the assumptions I made there, give an overview of what stuff I'm working on in general. And then within geometric optics, there are two main branches. There's illumination design and imaging design. So I'm going to start with illumination design, talk about some ray mapping methods I did and you know what illumination design is. And then we're going to get into imaging design, talk about the generalized design problem, uh, at the very end, we're going to get into some automated optimization and machine learning techniques. This talk roughly follows chronologically how I was introduced to these problems and what I worked on in real time. So this is kind of an interesting view of like the trajectory that I saw over the last five years, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it's going to be based on my publications almost directly. So I published five. The sixth one is about to be published. Uh, probably when you see this on YouTube, it will be published. Um, but I, I just submitted the like final revisions a couple days ago. And then there's two more that I'm currently writing that I talk about a little bit at the end. And those will also probably be published whenever you see this. So uh, you can look for those too. Uh, there are two patents that I also got while working on this, but they're not really talked about in this presentation. So let's get into it. So light is an emergent phenomena that shows up as the result of Maxwell's equation. So that's what I'm showing on the left here, these four differential equations. Um, ho hopefully many of you are familiar with these. Um, they're a set of differential equations that govern the properties of electric and magnetic fields and the relationship between the two. So, uh, you know, you can see there's four of them and the last two are kind of what we're focusing on here. Um, we can see in equation three that this dB dt represents a changing magnetic field. And this is capable of generating an electric field perpendicular to the magnetic field because it's the cross product. Um, and then in equation four, a changing electric field generates a magnetic field. And this reciprocal behavior produces a self-sustaining transfer of energy that originates from, um, from equation one, you can see electric field is generated from a charge density, this rho term. And in the fourth equation, the curl of B is generated by J, which is a current. So if you have a changing charge density, or a changing current over time, then you're going to get an electric and magnetic field that are changing over time, um, which then starts propagating new electric and magnetic fields. And you get this kind of wave behavior that takes energy and kind of sends it through space. And so this is what we call an electromagnetic wave. And I have a graph of this on the right. So the oscillation of electric and magnetic fields happen perpendicular to the propagation direction of um, this wave. And a small specific subset of wavelengths is what we refer to as light. So the, the stuff we can see is what we call light. Geometric optics, um, this is a very good description of light and it's very general, but it's kind of too complicated for many everyday situations. Um, these equations are kind of tedious. Their solutions take a lot of time. And so if you're working on a system or designing for something that is much larger than the oscillations of electric and magnetic field would have any impact to, you can kind of assume that these don't have too much of an impact on your final results and you just look at the propagation direction of light. So rather than dealing with all of this complex stuff, we just treat light as a ray and that makes the equation much, much simpler. So we have our ray origin O. Um, I use bold faced to denote vectors. Um, so O is a three dimensional vector that denotes where the ray starts. D is the direction of the ray and then T is just a constant along the direction of the ray basically saying how far you've gone. So in free space, you know, we have this ray equation and it basically says an incoming ray is gonna keep going straight. So here's a, a graph of an interface between two media. 
um, as denoted by their index of refraction, n1 and n2. And if both of those are the same, you can think of this just like as light going through air. It's just going to keep going straight, and that's not a very interesting case. So the incoming light ray I is going to hit the surface defined by its normal vector, and it's going to transmit through the outgoing ray vector O. And again, in free space, this is just a straight line. Um, the interesting cases are where you have a medium. So you can think of like glass is probably the most common one. Um, so if n1 is not equal to n2, you can see there's like this bending that occurs between the two rays. And so that bending depends on the angle that the incoming light ray I makes with the surface normal. Um, and then it's going to change the outgoing um, angle. According to the, the famous Snell's law, you probably see this in a lot of like introductory physics textbooks, um, saying that the, the ratio of these angles kind of goes as the sine of the theta. Um, and then multiplied by the index of refraction. And we can kind of do some things to simplify this. So rather than dealing with n1 and n2, we just look at the ratio of the two. So this mu term is n1 divided by n2. And that makes calculation easier later on. Um, and this works great for textbooks and two-dimensional kind of toy examples. But we can look at a 3D example and see that this equation is not really, you know, the, the sine theta doesn't really do everything we want it to do. So you can see here we have an incoming ray I coming from, you can see there's a light source somewhere over there. And that ray is going to hit the surface. Um, this is a glass optic. It's going to hit the surface at some location N, N and that normal vector is going to transmit the ray through. Um, and these are three dimensional rays now. So the, the question of what is this sine theta value gets a lot more complicated because you know there's no two dimensional symmetry and you have to do a lot of stuff. So Rather than working with sine theta, we can actually replace, replace this sine theta with the cross product. And so now we have this nice vector relationship um, that is a lot easier to work with. And so you can do a lot of math. I don't want to show it. Yeah, the solutions in my dissertation to solve for what the outgoing ray vector t is as a function of the incoming light ray i and the surface normal. And it looks kind of messy, but it's kind of beautiful in its own way. And so these are really just the two equations that govern all of geometric optics. Um, you have propagation, which means the light ray goes straight. And then you have refraction, which means when the light ray hits an interface, um, there's some transmitted ray, um, and it's bended according to that difference in index of refraction. Um, and from that, you can also get dispersion and reflection and things like that. So there's a little bit more than this, but essentially it's just these two equations. Um, Another thing to kind of describe is when I say a ray or a vector field, what I'm really talking about is a wavefront. So here's a picture of a wavefront. It's a three-dimensional surface, or a, it's a two-dimensional surface embedded in three-dimensional space. And you can see all of these vectors. Those are the normal vectors of the wavefront. And you can think of those as optical rays. So each ray propagates independently, right? They, the surface is going in the direction of the ray at each point along the surface. Um, but if you kind of look at these all together, the wavefront propagates all according to its surface normals through space. So normally when I describe this, we just draw rays, but you can think the rays are defining some continuous surface that has a vector at each point along that surface. Um, and so here's the graph on the left that is a you know the, the complicated 3D drawing. For most of this thing, I'm just going to work with two-dimensional drawings because they're simpler and easier to draw and understand. So this gets us to kind of the, the description of geometrical optics. You have your incoming vector field, I, and you have your outgoing vector field, T. And then there's some normal field. Um, you can think of it as an optical surface that transforms your incoming vector field into an outgoing vector field. And so essentially, the questions about geometric optics are related to the interplay between these three like characters. So ray tracing is a question of, you have your incoming ray field, and you know what that is. You know what your optical surface is, but you don't know what the transmitted surface looks like. And so ray tracing is you know, solving for where does the light go, what does it do, and things like that. Um, most of what we're going to be talking about in this talk is the optical design problem. So it's an interesting inverse problem, which are always fun, where you know what your incoming vector field looks like, and you know what you want your outgoing vector field to look like or what properties you want it to have, but you have no idea what kind of surface will get you there. 
And so you, you got to find out, you know, you got to calculate it or optimize or do something to figure out what optical surface will transform this incoming vector field to this outgoing vector field. Uh, the, the field of this you're probably most familiar with is the imaging problem. And we're going to kind of break that down. So imaging is where you have something in space. So let's say you have this beautiful corgi and you want to capture that information onto a target so you can kind of you know save a picture to look at your corgi later later on so the the blue thing denotes our target or our detector and so uh, in space you're going to have some light source so in this case it's the sun but you could have like a light bulb or something and that light source is going to shine light onto the thing you're trying to image so this corgi you know a light ray hits him right on his head and it's going to scatter light in all directions and the the important thing here is that scattered light has information about that object in space. So it has like the wavelength of light um, is changed by how it's scattered. Um, it has information on the position of that and things like that, but it's emitting light into a spherical wavefront that's gonna kind of propagate outward. So this is our incoming wavefront I, and if you could think of the wavefront surface, it's a sphere with rays going all the way along the normal of that sphere. What we want to have happen is we want to collect this entire wavefront and recollapse it down onto a point on our detector. So in order to make that happen, we need a converging spherical wavefront. So our T, our desired vector, is a converging spherical wavefront to map that point of the corgi's head onto a point on our detector. So the problem here is we need to come up with some surface that and uses Snell's law to make this transformation happen. And you can do this, you get some strange looking optical surface or vector field denoted by N that takes in these incoming rays and refocuses them down into a point. And if you do that, again, you've, you've captured that wavefront that has all the information about that location in your object. And so, you know, the corgi's head is kind of tan, so that light is gonna have some wavelength and intensity. And when we focus that onto our detector, we've now mapped that wavelength and intensity onto the image. So you can do this for many points, right? You're gonna hit his nose, it does not reflect light very well, so you're gonna get a dark spot when you recollect that wavefront. And you do this for all points at every location on the corgi, and you can reconstruct a complete image, which is actually really cool. When we look at this mathematically, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated, so rather than coupling one wavefront to one wavefront, it's actually a superposition of wavefronts, um, one for each uh, you know, spot in the object we're trying to recollect onto our image. And so we get what's called an overdetermined system of equations, where we essentially have infinite input wavefronts and output things we're trying to image. But n, our optical surface, you know, it's finite. We, in this example, we only have one surface. And so there's no way in general to satisfy this many equations with only one degree of freedom. So it's not going to be perfect. You're going to get, instead of crisp focused images, you're going to get some blurring at each point. So I've kind of denoted that by showing these circles, and the corgi is not going to be perfectly imaged. But what we can do, rather than solving this perfectly, we can kind of treat this as a minimization or optimization problem, where the goal is to, again, rather than doing this perfectly, we want to minimize this spot for each point. Because um, you only need it to be about as small as your detector, the resolution of your detector. Like if you have a pixel that's 15 microns, and your um, collection is about 15 microns wide in blur, that's okay, because that's the resolution of your detector anyway. So um, what we do instead is we choose our surface or surfaces to minimize the total amount of blur according to the system of equations. And so um, with one surface, you don't have much control to satisfy all of these. And that's why optical design usually invokes many different optics. So you can see here, this is kind of a common triplet where you have six radii of curvature that you can choose from, and then five distances, that gives you a lot more variables to try and satisfy the system of equations. And so that's why like expensive lenses have tons of elements and it lets you couple wavefronts from many different points in the object to your image. And that's how you can see here, we've shown three different points with this particular optic that focuses very nicely. So illumination is what we're gonna talk about first. And it's, very similar to what we just talked about, but also very different. So in the illumination problem, you have some light source that doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, like an LED has some cosine theta fall off, so you get kind of this like 
lighter regions at the edges. Uh, the best example I can think of is like car headlights. If you're driving on the road and they have their headlamp and it's shining into your eyes, that's not what you want, right? You want the light on the road. So the problem here is you add a lens to redirect that light to give it some uh, desirable properties. In this talk, most of my examples are just going to be designing for a uniform rectangle or square target because it's very easy to evaluate and demonstrate. But just know in general, you can kind of design for really whatever you want. Um, the, the headlight example is kind of a pretty good example too. So in this problem, we have I, you know, our light source is emitting some vector field or wave front. But now we're looking at the intensity distribution of that light. So there's some, you know, amount of optical power associated with each light ray. So we're going to call this E. And that's a function of the angle, right? You can have more power at the center. It depends on what your light source is and things like that. And what we want to do is essentially take this optical power, you know, density in space and map it to, in this example, it's a uniform square target. So the intensity or the irradiance on the target at each point is the same. And so this problem is kind of interesting where essentially in this case, the, the source is very small. So you only are coupling one wavefront. So there's one equation, and one unknown. So fundamentally it is doable. But the problem is you, it's a very, very hard solution mathematically. The surfaces you have to make to actually enforce this mapping are very complicated. And so we're still very much underway finding out methods of how to work through this. And one of the methods that I worked on and I'm very familiar with is optimal transport. And so optimal transport started when someone was looking out at a pile of dirt um, and was asking the question, actually many piles of dirt, and they're asking the question, how can I redistribute this dirt to flatten it out, right? If you want to like make it a nice flat plane, how can I do that while doing the least amount of work possible? So the desert, you know, sand is similar to dirt. Um, and you can take, the question is similar. If you could take sand from this picture and move it so that you get just a nice flat plane of sand, how could you do this without having to like move sand and then move it again? Um, so it's it's kind of an interesting mathematical problem. And the formulation, it's it's a bit heavy, but we'll we'll go through it graphically. Um, you have two domains. So you have omega zero on the left and omega one on the right. Um, we, we measure a pile of sand as a positive radon measure on this subset. Um, don't really worry about what a radon measure is, but basically we're we're moving some distribution from this original um, omega naught according to a mapping relationship u. Um, that takes it from there to the new domain. Um, probably this graphic will be more clear. So if you can think of like moving sand from the desert to itself, I've shown these domains kind of overlapped. And then the mapping relationship is shown by this vector. So you're taking a point x, y from the original domain, and you're moving it to x prime, y prime in the new domain. Um, and there's some cost associated with moving that sand that distance. So the simplest way you could do it, um, this function just shows, is just the distance you move, right? That, that was the simplest cost function you can have. So the amount of total work that you have to do to move all the sand from the original domain to the new domain, um, what this function essentially says is that you're adding together the cost of moving all the points from the original domain to the new domain. And so the optimal transport problem looks at this and says, okay, we wanna find this U or this U tilde um, that minimizes this for the entire problem. And this little MP just means it's mass preserving. So you're not losing sand during the process. It, you know, you're, you have the same amount of stuff you started with. And so that might seem kind of weird. How does that relate to optics? But remember, we have some optical density or energy density associated with our source and our target. And so rather than moving sand, we're trying to actually redistribute the light energy density um, using the same mathematical formulation that we did for the sand example we just gave. So our source has some light distribution, we'll call this omega naught, and our target has a desired light intensity distribution, we're going to call this omega one. And so we're, our goal here is to try and find a way to redistribute the source energy density onto the target in a way that doesn't move or lose light. So this MP here, um, we want to do it without losing light. So to kind of make it more clear, um, just to go back to the graphic I showed before, we have an incoming vector field I that has some intensity or irradiance associated with it. 
that's kind of shown in that graphic E, and we're trying to map it to the target I. So this mapping relationship, it's a two-dimensional vector-valued function. So it takes in x, y. So I'm showing this kind of as a uniform grid on the left. And it maps each x, y location to a new location x prime, y prime. So graphically, a good way to look at this is kind of as the distortion of a uniform grid. So you can see this mapping function f that I'm showing in red takes this input grid and distorts it to redistribute the light on the right side. And a good way to think of like what this is doing is you have a light, lot of light in the center. So what you need to do in the mapping function is spread this light out to get this light from the center into these two peaks. And so if you're spreading that light out, you're going to be stretching this grid. And that's why you see that the, the squares are very, very large between these two peaks because you had to spread the light out between the two. And so when calculating an optimal transport function, we're looking to essentially determine what this f is that does this mapping. Um, I don't think math is necessarily the place for presentation, so you can check my papers if you want the full derivation, but you can just know um, there's many ways to do it, and the, the most simple way here is you use some energy conservation equation where you sample the intensity distribution of your source and your target on a grid, and then you essentially just solve this integral equation to find where an energy conservation transport between the two um, is, and then you get the xy components. Um, we'll get into, I'm more interested in the applications than the actual math, but if you're interested in the math, it'll be in the description. Um, and so we have this mapping relationship, and now we need to make an optical surface that actually transport or redistributes this light. And so here's the Snell's law equation. It's slightly different because um, this is the form that I used uh, when I wrote this paper. But essentially the problem comes down to, we need to choose this normal vector n so that at every target point, this outgoing ray vector O is pointed towards the target point. So hopefully to break it down in a way that it's more simple, um, we have this graphic that I've been showing a lot. We have the ideal target distribution, and we're gonna calculate some discrete target points here shown in black from this ray mapping equation. Um, our goal here is then to choose this normal field so that each one of these incoming light rays hits the normal field and then is redirected onto the specific target point we've selected. And then once you have this normal field, you build a surface that has that normal field. And so the goal is then you have an optical surface that takes light rays in and bends them towards the targets that will enforce the mapping relationship so you can have the desired light intensity distribution on your target. Um, so this is where I started. That's kind of all the background for um, where I started working on this. And the, the first question is, where do you define this input domain? Because as I showed in, I think this figure, I can go back to it. Uh, here, you need to sample your light source at some point and calculate an integral to determine this mapping relationship. But the location of this mapping, this place you sample it from, is actually very important. So um, the, the place I started is you just pick a plane right above your light source before your actual optical surface and calculate it from there. And this works pretty well. So both of these were designed to be a uniform square. Um, on the left is for an on-axis design where you have a lot of symmetries. I think that's actually this optical surface I'm showing. There's a lot of symmetry and it's a very flat surface. So uh, the performance is quite good because your sampling surface is planar and your optical surface is almost flat. So there, there's no disconnect between the two. When you start moving off axis, uh, this is supposed to be a uniform square, but you can see it's nowhere near that. So this is the problem I first looked into. And my first idea for solving this is, rather than calculating the mapping relationship from a flat plane, why not calculate the irradiance distribution on the optical surface and then do a mapping calculation from there? Um, so the equation on the left is the how you calculate the irradiance on a surface. And we're just going to kind of go through it step by step. So the first thing you need to know, um, LA is the source radiance and source area. These are just properties of, you know, how your source emits light. And so if you're designing for a fixed source, these are roughly constant. This R squared is the distance to the target. There's many reasons to think of what this comes from. Um, you can think of like a point source as you grow a sphere from a point. The surface area is going to roughly fall off. Well, it's going to grow as r squared. So if you divide it by r squared, then you'll have like a constant quantity. Um, for me, mathematically, it just makes the most sense to look at 
uh, Maxwell's equations. So the divergence of the electric field is governed by how much free charge there is. So in free space or air, you can consider this to be zero. And so you just have the divergence of E is zero. Um, if you look at the divergence equation in spherical coordinates and just take the radial component, because that's all we're looking at, set that equal to zero, you end up getting this term where one over R squared times the partial derivative of R squared ER is equal to zero. Um, if you look at that, the only way the partial derivative of R squared ER with respect to R is zero is if ER is some constant over R squared. So that kind of is saying the same thing. That's why this R squared term happens. Um, and then the last two terms we have to look at are the source and surface projections. And these are kind of interesting. So we're gonna do a, a short overview of projection. Um, so you, you have some line of length L. And then you take this line and you tilt it by some angle theta. And then you're looking at it from the perspective of like this orange vector that I'm showing. And when you look at it, you're actually going to see a shorter line. It's going to look, it's going to be L cosine theta in length because um, you're looking at a projected view of it. And so compared to what you originally had, because you've tilted it, um, based on your perspective, it's going to look shorter. And so this matters a lot when you're calculating light energy density because if you tilt your surface and it looks like your, you know, the light is shining onto, from that perspective, a smaller area, the associated power density is going to go up. So these cosine thetas essentially just calculate or take into account the fact that the optical source is looking in one direction and the surface is looking in the other direction. So it's the first cosine theta is considering the fact that the source is looking at a projected value of the surface. The second cosine theta is taking into account that the surface is looking at a projected value of the source. And so you put all that together, you can actually calculate the irradiance on the optical surface. And so I've plotted this next to the sampled surface, and you can see they're actually very different. Um, the irradiance on the calculated surface is asymmetric. It looks more like what the actual optical surface looks like. And so when you calculate the mapping relationship from this asymmetric distribution, you get a lot of difference. Um, on the left is the original mapping relationship from that dummy plane. Um, but when you calculate the mapping relationship from the surface, it actually looks like the optical surface. There's asymmetry and a lot of things like that. So this improves performance. So on the left is what we did when we did the mapping from the flat plane. On the right is what you get when you calculate the mapping relationship from the actual optical surface. But it's still not perfect. So that was like my first paper. Um, the second paper was investigating what is still wrong with this representation. So I've kind of color coded this mapping relationship here. So like one ray from the target T, um, the red point corresponds to the red point on P, which is the optical surface. And so what I was doing is I was calculating the mapping from the surface, but it's only a two dimensional mapping relationship. So originally I was just taking the X, Y coordinates. You can think of this as like down projecting it onto this plane, which I'll just call P prime. And then calculating the mapping relationship between this flat plane and the target. So I've shown the mapping relationship is like basically in two dimensions how you would redistribute this light um, to get what you want on the target. Or you can think of this as like a, you know, I'm plotting these vectors here. But in reality, we're dealing with a three dimensional problem. The geometry of the system is three dimensions. And so you're not just moving light in x, y. There's some z component here. You need to take into account the height. Um, of their vector. So what I did, and this is going to seem strange, but I'll explain why it makes sense in a second. Um, you take a point, you take for all points along the target plane, um, you build a circle of radius one, um, and then you find where each one of these vectors hits that circle, and you construct a new temporary surface um, for all of those points. Uh, it seems weird but it's a, it's a mathematical surface. And now we're gonna calculate the mapping to the X, Y components of this mathematical surface, P double prime. So we do the same thing, we calculate this mapping relationship. And so let's see what this does. We, we take some vector V and we aim this vector according to the X and Y components of our mapping relationship, but we give it a magnitude of one. So it's a unit vector according to this mapping relationship. Because we specified that this surface um, is a long, like you basically build the surface so that if you do this, 
um, this vector is going to hit the target exactly where the mapping relationship wants you to. So for every single point, by doing this weird, like, um, it's essentially normalizing our mapping relationship, we now can embed the three-dimensional information of our geometry into our two-dimensional mapping relationship. And this lets us, gives us a lot of control. So we can see what this does. So on the top is our original mapping relationship. On the right, you can see it's very symmetric. And on the left, I'm showing the vector curl. Right now, you can think of this as essentially the error in the mapping. Um, and it's on the order of 10 to the minus 15. So it's essentially zero when you just look at the two-dimensional representation. On the bottom is where I've done this kind of normalization process of our mapping relationship. So you can see um, in D, it has the asymmetry that kind of you would expect from a vector field. So in C, you can see now that we've normalized this mapping relationship and got the full three-dimensional information in there, the curl is increased by 11 orders of magnitude. Um, and it has a very interesting shape. So on the left is the Z component of the mapping curl. In the middle is surface error. And on the right is the irradiance on the target. And I think you can be pretty confident that, or you can understand why I called Z component error, because all three of these line up perfectly. So the mapping curl actually introduces surface error. The specifics of it is if you have a vector field with curl in it, it's going to violate the integrability condition. And so you can't actually build a continuous surface to enforce this mapping relationship. So it's going to introduce some surface error. And if there's surface error, that means you can't actually, there's no continuous surface. So the surface you end up making is not the surface you wanted. And so the light's going to end up in a different spot. Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about why having less curl matters is you can look at this relationship. So you have some density in the center and you want to redistribute it to the edge of this circle. The most efficient way possible to do this is just having a vector field that is radially outward. Um, and that's a curl free vector field. Anything else, any amount of curl in your vector field is going to, going to require your vectors to overlap slightly. And that's going to increase the distance that each one of these points has to travel. So it is not the optimal transport solution. It is inefficient. Um, and these inefficiencies mean you actually can't make a surface that enforces them. So let's get rid of it. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we can decompose any vector field into a curl and diver divergence free term. So on the left is curl free, which is kind of what we said. It's just kind of pointing outward. And what we want to do, um, it's been shown in math. You can read um, these references below that the optimal transport mapping relationship is the gradient of a convex function. Essentially, it is curl free. So we want to get rid of all of the divergence. And how do we do that? Well, uh, this paper, it's a fantastic paper. I strongly recommend reading it. Um, they, they came up with this method and you can read how they got it. Um, but essentially what we do is we take our normalized vector field, this bold U, and we plug it into this equation to reduce the curl of our vector field iteratively. I have a flow diagram to show how I do it. So uh, this little perpendicular sign just means a two-dimensional rotation. So you kind of like swap x and y coordinates. Um, the div is taking the divergence. And then this like little inverse triangle means a solution to Poisson's equation. So we take the divergence of our vector field, we rotate it, then we solve Poisson's equation. Um, then, you know, we have to re-rotate it again and take the gradient. Uh, the du is the Jacobian of this mapping relationship because we want it to be mass preserving. So we have to calculate that Jacobian. Um, and then we calculate the time step and update the solution. And then we renormalize the vector field every step. So you do this over and over and over again. And every step, you're reducing the amount of curl in the mapping relationship. So here's kind of a graph of the convergence. It's relatively linear. In about 100 steps, we went from, we reduced the curl by an order of magnitude. And you can see there's still some left. So the, the numerical stability of my method could see some improvement, but we reduced the curl by an order of magnitude. So we'll see in a second how impactful that was in the final solution. So here's an example of what I'm designing for. It's, it's a, you have a point light source that's emitting light onto a reflective surface. And that surface is redirecting light onto a target that's some distance offset from where your light source is. And so you can see 
uh, that that color graph shows the optical surface. It's very freeform, kind of strange looking, but uh, so let's look at the results. On the left is what we started with calculating a mapping from a dummy surface, and it's about 68% uniformity. When we decided to take into account the geometry of the system, uh, we do mapping from the two-dimensional lens surface, we get 82% uniformity. Uh, but now that we've found a way to kind of embed this three-dimensional vector information into our mapping calculation, we actually get 99% uniformity. And you can see there's still some kind of like noise in there. So numerically, um, we, we probably need to improve our method a little bit, but the human eye wouldn't pick up on any of that. So 99% uniformity is still very, very good. Uh, the next question I started looking at is, um, how do you tilt your, sor your source? So I think in this diagram, I have my light source and it's aimed at the reflector, which hits the target, but it, the, the light source is tilted kind of to an arbitrary angle, right? Um, I could tilt it any other way and still be able to build a mapping relationship that transmits light. So kind of showing this with a refractive surface. Um, so this is like a, you can think of this as a glass optic. When you're designing for a target that is not directly beneath or directly in front of your light source, there's a lot of freedom you have in how you can aim the initial light source. So you can aim it straight down. That's one option. Uh, maybe the most intuitive option is aim your light source so that the center ray points at the center of the target or anywhere in between. And I, I really had no idea how to design for any of this. So I came up with my own method. So I just decided to design for refractive efficiency. And essentially what's happening here is when light ray, when a light ray hits uh, the interface between two medium, there's a transmitted ray and there's a reflected ray. And so that reflected ray, if you're trying to send light through, is just light that's lost. And the more you're trying to bend the ray at the interface, the more light's going to be reflected backwards. Now, this is where we kind of have to deviate from the geometric approximation a little bit, because the nature of this reflection depends on the specific orientation of the electric and magnetic field oscillations with respect to how you're hitting the surface. Um, so you can think of these are called the S and P polarization modes. Um, in this example, we're just assuming that it's randomly polarized. So the oscillations of the electric and magnetic field just kind of happen in any direction, which gives you the average of these two values. Now, there's a lot of math I went through to build up a model of what the loss on the optic actually looks like. And that's in the paper if you want to read how I did it. Um, the equation is there on the bottom left. It's pretty messy, but what it ends up being is you calculate the power of each ray um, and you multiply that by the reflectance value of the optic. And then you just divide by the total power. And you can calculate this as a function of the tilt angle, actually. And so that's the equation on the right. The predicted value is what I got from my equation. And then I actually built surfaces and calculated them. And there's actually a very good deal of alignment between my model and reality. And what it gives us is just you know this nice function. We can look at the graph and find the minima to calculate the optimal tilt. So in this case, around 37 degrees um, gives us the optimal tilt, and it reduces the loss by a substantial amount. Now here's a kind of a graphic of what I'm doing here. Here's a freeform optical surface on the right, kind of looks like an egg, and it's taking light from this source, redirecting it to be a uniform square um, on the target, and then there's some offset. So that offset is how far away from the target I am, and the target has some width. We'll get to that, you know, why those matter in a second. But here's a graph of why you're losing light and where it's coming from. So when you don't tilt your source at all, um, the, the color bar denotes how much light you're losing at each point along the surface, and it's normalized across all of them. So when you don't tilt it at all, there's a ton of light lost on the left side. And if we look at this figure, it kind of makes sense. Um, if you have your light source not tilted at all, there's a bunch of light that's emitted onto the left side that you have to redirect really far to hit the target. And all of that bending is going to induce a lot of reflection and loss of light. So not tilting at all is bad. Um, then you start tilting it and that light loss decreases because those rays are kind of more reasonably oriented with respect to the target. And then if you tilt it too far, like in this 50 degree example, you start losing light on the right side, which makes sense again, because 
you have the same problem where you've tilted it so far that light rays coming from the right side of this optic have to bend really far to get to their local their point on the target. So the optimal point would be tilting it so that you have the least amount of bending. And as we calculated, and you can kind of see here, it's around 37 degrees. So I took that and I did a parametric analysis over many different target offsets and width to find the optimal tilt values. So the X, look, the X coordinate on this graph on the left is this lateral offset from the target. So if we go back here, that's essentially how far you are from the center of the target. And the Y axis is the target width or how wide this distribution is you're trying to design for. So it makes sense the farther away you are, um, the color denotes the tilt you can see on the color bar on the right. So the farther away you are, the bigger this offset, the more you have to tilt it. That just makes sense. The interesting thing is actually how much more efficient you can make your optic just by tilting it the proper way. So you can see here the efficiency gain is up to 150% just from tilting your lens. That's kind of crazy. Um, but that's compared to just not tilting it at all. Um, the intuitive solution and what I thought would be optimal when I went into this is, well, what if you just aim your light source at the center of the target? And you can see on the left, so I'm plotting the difference between the optimal tilt and aiming at the center. Um, if the target is very small, so the bottom of this graph, um, the difference is almost zero. So if your target's like a point and you're trying to design for it, it makes sense that you have to aim at the center because the target's not very big. Um, but as the target gets bigger, it turns out that the optimal tilt is actually not aimed at the center of the target. And on the right side, that's the efficiency gain. You can actually still get about a 25% performance boost by um, tilting according to this optimal calculated value rather than just blindly, blindly aiming at the center, which is very substantial. So when I was looking at this, um, the examples I showed were with reflective systems. So I, I looked at a similar model I built up my loss function. It turns out that aluminum is very good at reflecting light. So the loss with respect to tilt changes by like 0.12%, which is not very substantial. So I had to come up with a new like criteria by which to design my system. And I came up with uh, trying to design not obstructed optics. So you can think of this as like, if you take a light bulb and shine it right into a mirror, the light that the mirror reflects is going to be blocked by the light bulb because it's in front of the mirror. And so that's what this graphic on the left is showing that our source, which is this black dot, is emitting light, which is hitting the, the optical surface. And then it's reflecting that light down to the target T. And so you get this like bundle of light between these two vectors O, which is the, the optical source is actually within that bundle. So you're gonna shine light and then it's gonna hit your source. You're gonna get like a source shaped hole of light on your target. So what you wanna do is have a not obstructed target where our optical source is actually outside of this ray bundle. So we can shine light onto the surface, have it reflect, hit the target, and the source doesn't get in the way. And so we construct this vector V, which essentially calculates how far we are outside of this ray bundle. And we want to, you know, design for some tolerance. So we pick a distance D that we are outside of that ray bundle and solve for it. Um, the math is pretty messy. Again, you can check the paper in the description if you want to see how I get there. But you end up getting the arc cosine of this value D over all this vector nonsense. Um, don't worry about that too much. What you end up getting is essentially this equation that gives you your distance from source as a function of tilt angle. And then if you want like four millimeters of clearance between your ray bundle and your light source, like if you have packaging or mounting or something like that, um, then you can go into this graph. Say if you want four millimeters of clearance in the X direction, it's gonna be about 30 degree tilt um, that will be optimal. So that's actually the end of my illumination stuff. And now we're going to get into imaging and talking about the design problem. Okay, so let's get into it. The design problem, this is going to be kind of an overview of the abstract design problem as I see it. So you have these two mathematical spaces, which is the design parameter space and the performance parameter space. And I'm going to go through each one. So the design parameter space is comprised of all of the potential degrees of freedoms you have to make a design. Um, so in this case, we're designing a triplet. So you have six radii of curvature, 
five separations that gives you an 11 dimensional design space. And you can think of the act of actually making a design as just putting a point in this 11 dimensional design space. So each point is its own unique design. And then you can move around in this space to kind of scan through all possible designs. So it's, it's just a mathematical space. This 11 dimensional space, each one of these points has some performance value associated with it. So in this example, I'm showing a five dimensional performance space. And the interesting thing here is we get to choose what the performance parameters are and what the space looks like. So um, some things you could have is like image quality, tolerances, like you wanna be able to actually make the thing, weights or how heavy it is, how big it is, how much it costs. And you can keep adding stuff and use whatever you want to evaluate it. But the thing is that there, these evaluation functions take in points from this 11 dimensional design space and output a value for performance. So it's just a function that maps the design parameter space, at, which we'll call x, to the performance parameter space. So the evaluation is just you know going y equals f of x. Um, so the, the design problem is looking at this function. And the problem is it's not invertible. So what does this mean for us? Well, we know what we want, right? Let's say we want to make a design that's very cheap, works perfectly, thermally stable. Um, it's really tiny and all that good stuff. So we know what we want. And so the idea is we could just take this performance parameter space and follow the mapping back, get the designs that actually would make a system that has these performance properties, and we're done. But this is not an invertible function, so there's no way to go backwards. So the design problem, we're kind of stuck. Um, and so this graph, I think, really captures what the design problem is and the challenges associated with it, where you can do an evaluation of the forward step. Like if you have an optical system, you can just do ray tracing and see the performance. But so you can go from left to right, but there's no way to, given performance, find an optical system. So it's a pretty interesting and challenging inverse problem. Um, the first and probably the most popular way people overcome this is optimization. And what you do, to do is you make a linear approximation around some starting point. So you pick a starting point and you build up a linear function based on the gradient at that point. And you take a tiny step in the direction of the gradient that seems like it's going to improve performance. So if you keep taking these tiny steps, um, hopefully performance is getting better and better and better because that's the direction you're going. And eventually you get to a point where performance is good enough and you've completed your design. So kind of graphing this on two, di two dimensions should be easier to follow here. You have the design parameters X um, and then at each design parameter, there's a performance parameter value. And so optimization, if you start at the point at the top, you keep optimizing down, you get to the local minima. And I say local minima because that's the problem here. This gradient function only gives you information of the local landscape around where you started. So you can optimize the system, you know, you optimize, you get to a point and then you're at the minimum. So the gradient is actually zero. So it doesn't tell you where to go. So you think you're done, but you know, if we're plotting it like this, we can actually see there's a better region out here that we can't get to because we started too far away. So the next thing I was looking at is, well, what if we tried many different starting points? So we have all these dots and we want to optimize all of them simultaneously. So we optimize the ones on the left, they converge to this local minima. We optimize the one on the right. It converges now to a new different local minima. So this is the first attempt at kind of a global approximation or a global optimization where rather than just finding the local minima through optimization and being happy, we're trying to scan the entire space to find the best possible system we can design. So this is gonna be kind of a, a toy example just to get you introduced to what I'm going to be doing. So we're looking at three mirror systems and these K terms are the conic constant and phi is the, the optical power. And I'm showing this here as kind of unfolded because drawing this diagram as if the mirrors, you know, the mirrors are reflecting light, but if you just kind of show it unfolded, you can draw it as if they're passing light through. It's just easier to show here. And the first step here is to reduce the degrees of freedom through enforcing constraints. So um, constraints, rather than looking at the entire scope of the design parameter space, what you do is you essentially force, or you pick values to force your system to have better performance so that you can reduce the scope of things you have to look at. So we have eight degrees of freedom here. We can pick 
the power, the conic constant, and all the separations between all of them. And that's a lot of things to look at. But we know that we want our final system to have certain properties. So we're gonna enforce these constraints to reduce aberrations in the final image. So um, we, want to, we want our system to image. So we pick the separation between lens two and three to make sure it images. We want it to have no spherical aberration, no astigmatism, no coma. And field curvature just means that we're focusing to a flat plane. So if we have no field curvature, um, we can focus to a detector perfectly. So by enforcing all of these to meet the constraints, we've narrowed our degrees of freedom down to just three values. Um, and this is mostly done so that we can plot it and look at it, and it's easier for demonstration. So by enforcing these constraints, we've reduced our design parameter space to just three dimensions, uh, the power of the first two lenses and their separation. And for this example, we're just gonna have a one dimensional performance space, which is just the RMS spot size of our final image, which if you remember when I first showed the imaging problem, this is like how big those circles are um, when you're trying to image the corgi. So you're, you're trying to shrink all of them for every point. So the first step here is we randomly fill the solution space. So I've plotted phi one, phi two, and T one. These are our three variables. And I just filled it with points. And then I kind of threw away the points that didn't make sense. So the color bars on this graph essentially show how big the optics would be if you actually built this system. And so I threw away everything that was too big. I think the max marginal ray height, anything that was greater than 100 meters, I was like, no, you can't make that. <laughs> um, and so that's why the entire space is not filled. We're just showing systems that, you know, could maybe possibly ever be built at some point. And so we take all of these systems and then we optimize them. And so this should be more clear of what's going on. So these are the reflective systems. So light's coming in from the left. It's hitting that mirror all the way on the right. Um, then that mirror is focusing to the mirror on the left, and then it bounces back, hits the third mirror, and then the images on the left, you can see they're all nice points. And so to evaluate the performance, I'm looking at the diffraction MTF, or the modulation transfer function. What this graph essentially shows is the contrast you have as a function of spatial frequency. Um, so high spatial frequency just means you're looking at smaller and smaller things. So if you have a good contrast, at a high spatial frequency, that means you can image small things crisply. And so the ideal case is like a linear function straight down, because it depends on how big of an optic you have as to how much or how high of spatial frequency you can image. So if it's diffraction limited, then our optics are able to create a crisp image as well as they could be as limited by how big of an optic it is. Um, th there's a lot to explain here, so if you're not familiar with this, you can just look up diffraction efficiency and things like that. But just know that the ideal case is kind of just a line, uh, kind of like this one. This one looks pretty good. So here's another mirror system. So light comes in from the left, hits that tiny mirror, reflects to that first uh, sphere, then that reflects across to the right sphere and then forces an image. And you're probably noticing something here. These aren't physically possible because the image detector is blocking light, same with the mirror is blocking light. And that's because our performance parameter space only cared about the performance of the system and not the geometry. We'll get to that in a little bit. So here's some more examples. This one, this is what diffraction limited looks like. It's just a straight line, basically. This one was my favorite. So this is a fisheye lens. So it can accept a 165 degree field of view, which is really big. And to do that, it uses distortion. So that graph on the bottom left shows rather than imaging to a flat plane or like a square, it kind of images to this kind of warped looking shape you can see, which is not amazing, but it's the best thing you can do to focus something that large onto a plane. Because you're taking a sphere and mapping it to a plane, and that's mathematically very complicated to do. But uh, you can't make these, so we'll get that to that in a second. So abstractly, what we just did is we generated a bunch of points um, that I'm showing here. Each one of those points, then we optimize to find the local minima that have good um, performance. But as we said before, the geometry doesn't make sense. Like this system, you just have light rays being blocked all over the place and it's really, really large. Like you would never be able to make that. So the next step is, okay, let's optimize for performance and geometry. And the most common way to do this 
is to tilt the lenses so that they're not all in a row. So now you can kind of redirect the light down and around so you can move the lenses outside of the ray path so you can actually build it. The problem with doing this is you now break symmetry and the design process gets much harder and you need much more, I guess, freeform surfaces to have good imaging properties. So you can see on the right, I took something that had very good performance and then I tilted it off axis. So now the diffraction MTF is nowhere near that flat line. So this performance would be, it would, have, it would have really bad imaging quality. So here's what the design problem looks like in this case. We have a 36 dimensional design space, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, you have the power tilt and separation you had before, but because we're dealing with a much more complicated asymmetric design, you have to introduce Zernike coefficients to describe your surfaces. And the Zernike co polynomials or Zernike coefficients are, it's a set of orthonormal polynomials on the unit circle. And so what it is is you just have all of these nice simple functions. And what you do is you add them together to get complex general surfaces. So we're, we're picking uh, 33 different Zernike coefficients that we can kind of add in different relationships to get very free form looking surfaces that will hopefully have better imaging properties. And then we have uh, two-dimensional performance space now we want the optic to focus well and we want to make sure that geometrically like it's physically possible to make so this is now our new design problem and the temptation when you're doing a design like this in software there's an optimizer and you just want to trust it so you just you know you input your system you set everything as variable and you just click the optimize button and see what happens uh, well, unfortunately, this doesn't have exactly the effect you would want. So um, we started with the system on the left, we optimized everything, and we got the system on the right. So the performance improved. So we went from this nasty looking diffraction MTF to a diffraction limited system. But a lot of things changed. So the system got way bigger. Um, you can see that third mirror is actually blocking the light coming in. So you couldn't actually make this. Um, the F number increased, which means you can see the spatial frequency on the bottom here. Originally, diffraction limited meant we were able to image 800 cycles per millimeter, and now it's only 350. So that places a theoretical limit on how small of things we can image using this um, lens. And so we're, we're going to kind of walk through what happened and how we can solve it. And to do that, I'm highlighting two variables. So we have this theta, which is the tilt of the second lens and then tease the separation between that second lens and the third lens. So you can think of by choosing these two values, you're kind of aiming this third lens in space um, or positioning it in space. So like if you increase T, you can move lens three outside of the ray path. And then at each one of these theta and T values, there's some performance associated with it. You can think of this like optical performance. Um, this isn't real data, but it's for a demonstration. So let's say we started with some point. This is our initial system. And then we told the optimizer to optimize our system. So it's going to climb to the peak. Uh, it's trying to find the best performance. But as we saw, this system is not possible to design because that third mirror is blocking the light ray. So even though, you know, mathematically the optimizer saw it as something that can work, it's within the realm of impossible designs. So what we want to do is rather than finding the best design, what we want is the best possible design or the best one we could actually make. So we would like our optimizer rather than finding the peak, find the, the highest point within the region of possible spaces. One way to do this is to explicitly constrain variables. So you can think of this as like going through mathematically and defining the distance between each surface and each other surface and making sure that that distance is greater than um, the width of the ray bundle at that location. And it, it gets really, really complicated. And you'd have to do this every single time you did a design. I don't really know how to do that in general. Um, the other way to do this is limit the variables or don't optimize everything at once. So as a designer, I can look at this and say, okay, maybe I can optimize the surface shapes but I don't let the surfaces tilt while I'm optimizing them because that can completely change the geometry in an unstable way. And then you get you know, the system we saw before. So let's look at what effect this might have on our optimization process. So we start at the same point. 
And now we're just going to optimize along T1. So it's just a one dimensional optimization instead of two. It's gonna climb the peak, which is not very high. And then we're gonna optimize along theta one to get to this, you know, our second optimization process. So by not changing anything except for the variables our, optimize, our optimizer can work with, we've actually been able to dramatically change the path that the optimization process takes. And so in two dimensions, you know, you don't have much control over the trajectory, but you can think of right now we have a 36 dimensional design space with the problem we're working on. So the control you have over where, what the optimizer is going to go through by turning variables on and off is actually extremely high. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. The goal of this whole process is to come up with a method that can design optics automatically so that you know I as a user don't have to do anything and the computer can kind of figure out where the optimal path is um, through the optimizer to get to the best performance. So we want to represent this process with a data structure so we can work on it, optimize it, and improve it. So um, on off is pretty easily represented with a binary string. So we can think of each one of these design variables. Um, if, it's, if we're varying it during the process, it's going to be one, and if it's not being varied, it's going to be a zero and fixed. And so during each optimization step, we read off this binary string, choose which variables we allow to change, we show them in red, and we do an optimization. And then if you have many, many different optimization sub-processes, um, you can describe this by a very long string. So the first optimization step, you grab all these points in yellow, run an optimization. The second step, you grab all the points in blue, do an optimization. And so here's a graph or a graphic showing all or the, that in full. So step one, we do an optimization and we get a new looking opti optical system for step two. So you can see like the spacing of the lenses has changed and the, the radii of curvature have changed. And so we grab a new set of variables, do an optimization again, and keep repeating that process until we're satisfied with the performance. Um, all these graphics are better explained in the paper, so if you're interested, I recommend reading it. It's a lot more clear than I can explain in a presentation. Um, but now we have a way to basically describe these trajectories that the optimizer is going through. But again, we want the computer to be able to handle this on its own. We want it to be able to improve performance over time. So the way I saw this is, well, the binary strings look very much like DNA. In fact, the original genetic optimization algorithms were based on binary strings. So why not use a genetic algorithm to improve these optimization sequences, which it's like a meta optimization because we're, we're optimizing our optimization sequence. So there's a lot of resources on genetic algorithms, but very quickly, a genetic algorithm is an optimization procedure based on the evolutionary process that gave us the, the incredible complexity and diversity of life that we see around us. Um, it's actually very simple in principle. And this is one of the really cool examples of emergent behavior where many tiny steps produce this extremely complicated result that is kind of beyond our wildest imagination. Um, and we see that in nature, but in our model even, if our model is very simple, we can still get very complicated results. So step one of this process is selection. So what this means is you evaluate the performance of all the members in your population. So you, you build up a bunch of binary sequences like the one shown above. You design optics following these maps and you find the ones that have the highest final performance. And you just take some fraction of those. So you can see some of those grayed out genetic sequences. You can think of them as dying because they, they didn't have, they weren't fit enough for their environment. Um, the second step is crossover. So um, in real life, you know, you get sharing of genetic sequences between parents to generate kids. Um, this is the same way you just take random chunks of DNA from each one of these um, survived members of the population, and you use that to generate offspring. So you can kind of refill the entire population base. And then the final step is mutation, because with just selection and crossover, um, you're only sharing relative genetic information. So if you have enough inbreeding or things like that, you can get stagnant. So mutation just gives you the possibility of exploring the entire design space. And it's very important for kind of locating uh, better genetic information and things like that. One thing that's important here is that 
there's no such thing as like the optimal animal uh, species evolve to adapt to their local environments so um, i'm just showing wombats because i really like them but you can think of like a wombat from australia I, I don't know much about them but they seem to be well adapted for their environment but they're not adapted for other environments so like if you put a wombat in antarctica it's just going to die um, so species adapt locally and what we get from that is that this genetic information might be shareable um, kind of to locally different or locally similar optical systems. So if you have a system you'd like to design uh, in the center, right? You want to optimize that optical system. The hope is that if you've designed other optical systems and you have the this genetic information or bit strings that tell you how to optimize them and it works, that you could take that information if the systems are close enough or similar enough and it would give you some utility when optimizing this new one. Um, okay, so we have a method to improve systems and optimize them. But again, I want this to be fully automated. So I don't even want to have to pick what the starting points are. So to generate a database to train all of this stuff with, I'm just going to generate them randomly. So on the left is I've picked random radii of curvature, random separations and random tilts for all of my lenses. You can see the optical performance is very bad. It's nowhere near focusing to points. Um, and to make sure or to check the geometry, because a lot of these are kind of wacky looking systems, uh, I built a ray tracer that just looks at the boundaries. And so I can do polygonal operations to see if the system self intersects or not. Um, so I can use that to evaluate the geometry of my, my optics. And so I built an optimizer using this kind of polygonal box representation to generate initial optics, um, look for ones that actually you know, they're physically possible, they don't self-intersect, and then optimize them. And I was optimizing for compactness because you really want an optical system to be as compact as possible so you can kind of, you know, put it somewhere efficiently. So I define compactness by the radius of the smallest circle that can enclose all of the optics. So you can see the circles are kind of shrinking. Um, there's, there's a lot more information in the paper here. Um, so putting it all together, this is the full algorithm. What we do is, if you want to design an optic, you pick something you'd like to design, then calculate the state space or the distance to all the points in the database. And again, we're hoping that local information will be shared between similar designs. So we're going to grab the 30 most similar um, optical systems gene map, or the, these binary strings, into our gene pool. And then we're going to run some number of generations of this genetic algorithm to improve the performance. And then the map with the best fitness score is kind of added to that state and then reintroduced back into the gene pool. So I started out with completely random bit strings and completely random lens systems. And then I had 30 of those random ones. I came in with a new random bit string and a new random optical system and ran this genetic algorithm. So now I have one that's been optimized. And so I throw that into the gene pool and get rid of one of the random ones. And so I keep doing this until I have 30 optical systems that have been optimized. And then you can keep going and build up, you know, a population that's much larger than 30. And so these are the results of doing the design using this method. So again, all of these were randomly seeded. So before I even got the initial design, I picked a random optical alignment. Then I optimized it so that they're very compact. So you can see they're actually kind of folded really nicely so the systems are small in this initial design. Then moving from the initial design to the final design, I added all these freeform Zernike terms and ran the genetic algorithm to add freeform terms and improve optical performance. Um, I didn't actually tell it how to avoid self-intersecting. The genetic algorithm took care of that. And so I didn't have to put any constraints. I didn't have to do anything. I just clicked a button and I got all of these optical designs, which are very, very close to diffraction limited at relatively large field of views. But the nice thing about this process is it's not limited. Like you could actually use this algorithm to design anything you wanted. It doesn't have to be optical systems. And so I was able to design three lens systems and immediately just add a fourth lens in my algorithm and make a design here. So the initial design again was randomly seeded. Um, and then I ran a genetic algorithm to get the final optical design. And this one is actually very good performance. So it's a 14 degree field of view, which is very large and it's almost perfectly diffraction limited.
So that's that's kind of ending what I did without talk, but there's a bit more future stuff you can do. Um, this bit sequence, these zeros and ones, can represent more than just variables. Um, you can put something like user actions in there, like increasing or de decreasing something, um, adding or deleting lenses are very possible. Um, dynamic bit string lengths are also possible. That's been used a lot in genetic algorithms for a while. And you see it in nature, right? The, the genetic sequence kind of grew over time. So you could definitely have a dynamic bit string. And then rather than an explicit distance-based gene pool selection, once this database is large enough, you could then train an AI to learn this sparse variable selection for you. So rather than having to run this genetic algorithm over and over, you, you have some AI that approximates a function that would give you <clears throat> the optimal optimization sequence. Okay, so let's put this all together, or putting this all together. So what have we been doing? In the first example, we had a three-dimensional design space and a one-dimensional performance space. And so we took these points, the initial points optimized them to get the local minima. And we had all these optimized points. In the second example, we had a 36-dimensional design space and a two-dimensional performance space. And here we're looking at the performance and the geometry or system size. And what we did in this case, um, so now you can see there's two dimensions to our performance space, is we again generated a bunch of random designs. So here's the random starting points. And then we optimize each one of these to have the smallest geometry possible. So these are now the compact designs. Um, we took these designs and then kind of rotated along to the second dimension of this space, looked at performance. So now these are the inputs to our second optimization. And we optimize these to have better optical performance to get our final results. So it's kind of a two-step optimization process. In the general case, we have, again, the correspondence between design parameters and performance parameters. And what we do is we pick random starting points, so all these discrete points in the design space, and find out where what their performance is. And then we do an optimization on these design parameters to improve performance, right? So hopefully, rather than mapping randomly in the performance parameter space, they'll, they'll kind of have good performance. And so through this process, we found a mapping between two subspaces of these two mathematical regions, where we now have the good design parameters and good performance parameters. We can think of this correspondence as data, right? Um, this is actually the only way I can think of where you can kind of cheat this relationship, where you normally can't go backwards from the performance parameter space. But if you've made a design already um, and you have that stored as data, um, these rays can be traced both ways. So you can just take that data point and now you have your design. And it, you know it's not that useful because if you have a new design you want to make that you haven't made before, um, this discrete data representation doesn't actually give you information on how to go backwards. But uh, what I'm hoping to do, or what I did do, is create a generalized function approximator. So we have all of this data. And if you get enough data, you can actually start to kind of fine tune a continuous functional representation of this inverse relationship. So now, if we have a new design and we've had enough data to train this function approximator, we can actually just trace it back through this continuous function and solve the design problem in a much easier way. So uh, this function approximator, we're going to use an artificial neural network. And there's a lot here, but artificial neural networks are just generalized function approximators. That's all they are. And we, when you train a neural network, you're just strengthening this input-output relationship that you're trying to design it for. Um, you're just approximating some function. Um, so let, let's get to an example. So we're, we're going to design some illumination mirrors. And these mirrors we're designing are freeform reflective mirrors. And they're off-axis. So you can see the, the source is kind of offset from where the target is. And the target is going to be a uniform square illumination pattern. Um, this is a pretty complex design, so I'm going to be using the spherical harmonics to represent my optical surface. And the spherical harmonics, just like the Zernike polynomials, it's an orthonormal basis, and this time on the unit sphere. So you get all these kind of simple polynomial functions on the sphere, but you add them together to describe a very complex surface. So here's an example where they took a bunch of these independent functions, added them together, and they actually used it to describe electrical, I think, electrical potential on the human brain. So they're really general. You can describe any function on the unit sphere with them. So we use them here. And so 
This gives us a 123 dimensional design space where we have the, the alpha and beta tilts, which is just the X and Y targeting of our um, optic. And then we have the 121 spherical harmonic terms because we actually had to go up to 14th order polynomials to describe the surface. That's how free form they were. And we're doing something kind of interesting here. For a performance space, we just want to design optics that create a uniform square at a specified offset in X and Y. So our performance parameter space is just delta X and delta Y, which essentially says how far offset our target is. So we, I built a lot of stuff, and I'll say how I did it in just a second, um, to, to design these. So here's our database. It's a discrete database, so it's not completely filled. And the grayscale um, pictures are showing the actual light intensity distribution or irradiance distribution on the target. And those are shown in linear scale, but the human eye perceives light as a logarithm. So these would look like almost perfect rectangles to you as a human if you saw them. And then the color bar denotes the percentage deviation from a perfect square uh, pattern. So we're about like 3.6, around 4% at the worst, which is pretty good. To generate this database, there's kind of a lot you need to know, but ray tracing spherical harmonic surfaces is, I, I wrote a ray tracer to speed up this optimization process to design these optics. So the spherical harmonics, there's a lot you need to know about them, and I recommend reading about them a lot. They're really cool. Um, but they're, they're a function on the unit sphere. So you can think of them as basically putting a radius at each angular location. So you have f of theta phi, and each theta phi, there's some scalar value that says how far out the surface is. Um, mathematically, this is a star-shaped surface, which is a, it's, it has a unique property. So they're not convex. Convex means any line traced through it will hit it at most twice. So you can see it's hitting this surface four times, but it's convex about a point. So if you take a line from this center point and draw it outward, it's actually going to hit the surface exactly one time. Not, not just one time, it will hit it one time. And so this is really, really nice for something we'll get to in a second where your surface has exactly one point per angular location if it's defined around your point source. So if you want to do ray tracing, there's five things you have to do. You have to determine your source emission, find where the source rays hit the target, evaluate the surface normals on, the tar on your surface, um, compute the refracted ray directions, and then find where you hit the target. For this talk, I don't have time to go through all of them. We're just going to look at these three and how they relate to the spherical harmonics. So the problem with finding the intersection locations is you have your source ray, so we have this line, and the question is, where does this ray actually hit the lens? So we've been through this. The ray equation is O plus dt, where O is the starting vector and d is the directional vector. And our surface, um, in this case, or in general, is going to be described as a polynomial equation of order n. So you, you add up together all these polynomial terms up to an nth order polynomial. And the intersection means you basically just take this ray equation, substitute it into the surface equation. Um, the ray equation is linear. So we end up finding the roots of an nth order polynomial equation, which is very, very complicated to do. In fact, it's been proven that for polynomial equations higher than fourth order, there is no analytic solution in general. So this is a very complicated and time consuming process that can go wrong. There's many different routes. Um, so this is the hardest part of the whole problem. But we're dealing with the spherical harmonics, which are a star shaped surface. And we already said there is by definition a unique intersection at each angular location. So by defining our surface, right, each ray we're tracing from the center point we're aiming our rays using theta and phi. So that, that determines a ray direction. But our surface is also defined in terms of theta and phi. And the ray in that direction is going to hit the surface in that direction. So the intersection locations are identically the surface points if you're tracing from a light source that is at the coordinate origin of your surface. So you actually just kind of skip this entire process, which is really nice. Um, then we need to compute the surface normals. And because our surface is a, it's a two-dimensional surface embedded in three-dimensional space, right? It's parameterized just by theta and phi. We need some way to get the, the third dimension in there, this r hat. So that's why the normal vector equation has this kind of weird uh, shape to it. 
Um, but in order to do this, we need to take the gradient of the spherical harmonics, which seems like it might be a little bit complicated and difficult, but fortunately, uh, the vector spherical harmonics exist, and they're very, very useful in many different areas of physics and stuff. Um, they're mostly used to describe electric and magnetic fields because they're vector functions, um, but they're also used to describe scattering phenomena. They're used for like shading and stuff in computer graphics. So they're really useful and their their form is very mature. What we're interested in is on the left you see this M that is equal to the gradient of the spherical harmonics. And they actually have derived this M in terms of spherical harmonic coefficients. So we can write the gradient of the spherical harmonics in terms of the original spherical harmonics we had before. So calculating this actually ends up being very straightforward. Um, you just have to look up some terms. And then the, the third step, is, or the fourth step, is refraction. So we have our good friend Snell's law, which tells us how uh, the outgoing vector S2 is as a function of the incoming vector S1. Well, uh, because the way our surface is, S1 is always going to just be in the r hat direction because we're just emitting from the center of a circle or a sphere. So all of these complicated cross products and dot products simplify. And we get a very, very nice equation. Um, we can write the normal vector in terms of just spherical harmonic terms. So we actually have an analytic form for the outgoing ray direction. And because we're just intersecting with a planar target, there's also an analytic form for this target. So by ray tracing the spherical harmonics, um, we actually get this analytic derivation for t. This t vector gives us the x and y locations where any of these rays are going to hit the target as a function of theta and phi. So we're mapping the income, the it's a mapping from theta and phi, which is where each vector is aimed to the target point. And so you're going to get, you know, a, a nice distribution of points on your target. Um, and that's almost what we want. We have x, y locations in space. What we want is optical density on the target or the power per unit area. Well, each ray has some power associated with it. So what we can do is dis um, divide up our target into a bunch of bins count the number of rays that hit each bin and so the rays have some power so we get the total number of power in each bin and then each bin has some area so we just divide by the area of the bin so we get the power per unit area at every point on the target and so this gives us a way to map from you know this kind of discrete ray bundle representation to um, power per unit area which is what we want what we're trying to design for and so by doing all of this um, you know, taking advantage of the spherical harmonic symmetry, we can do ray tracing really, really quickly. In fact, um, we have this analytic equation for the target point. So it's not even really ray tracing in the traditional sense. We're just plugging stuff into an analytic equation to get these target points. So if we're trying to do an optimization process of our light distribution, we can do it really, really fast. So I wrote this in MATLAB, which is obviously not the fastest code, but that's one optimization process to design an optic. So we went from uh, the starting distribution was nowhere near perfect. There's very high peaking and stuff. Um, I did a, about a three second, I don't know, you, you could see how fast that process was. And it was almost perfectly uniform rectangle. Um, it's still not great, this is just a demo, but that's how I generated this database is just designing optics over and over again. Um, I had to obviously optimize these for more than four seconds because the performance is much better, but I generated a database using that. So that's the database that we were talking about like 10 minutes ago. And we're trying to, again, design a neural network to find a mapping between the performance parameters, this delta X, delta Y, and all of these design parameters. So the goal here is you just input the offset you would like to have a target designed for, and it'll just give you a surface that will enforce that, or that will design that. So I'm just kind of showing these colors that I've been showing the whole time, showing that we're doing the reverse mapping that we had before. And so this neural network, I trained it, and it actually learned a continuous representation of the discrete data. So the left is the database, and on the right is the neural network continuous representation of that data. So you can see um, the performance is almost identical to the database, but we, we can do it for every single point and if you look at the grayscale color maps, they still look almost like perfect uh, squares. So the neural network did a good job. So let's look at more
kind of interesting examples here. We're designing a refractive surface and you can see why we needed so many spherical harmonics. That's a very strange looking shape. Um, and we're designing it for a uniform rectangle of a given height, width, and distance away. So essentially what we're trying to do here is, I guess we'll get to that in a second. The design problem here is a 36 dimensional design space. So because this problem has symmetry, we're not offset. Um, we only need 36 spherical harmonics. So the, the surface shapes at least have some type of symmetry and they're easier to describe. And in this case, we have a three dimensional performance space because we want to take care of the width, height, and distance to the target. So here's our neural network. And what we're trying to do is determine a function where if you want to design an optic that will take in an LED and create a uniform rectangle of a given width, height, and distance away, this function will just take care of that. And that's so cool. Like you just have this function, you could just like put it on a phone or a web page. Someone can put in input what they want and it'll just give them a surface that will do that. Um, so I, I trained a neural network and it actually worked way better than I ever thought it would have. So you can see with this like place that I've highlighted, that's where I put data, that's where I trained the neural network to design stuff. But it actually was capable of making designs way outside of what I showed it. So in this graph, you can see I showed it how to design targets between a width of two and four meters. And it actually was able to design a tar uh, an optic to create a square target eight by eight meters with, um, you can see that's like maybe 20% deviation from the square. You can see by the, the light pattern, it's not perfect, but it's still very close to a square. Um, and that would be a good like starting point to do future optimizations. And then on the right, you can see it actually learned to generalize distances too. So I trained it just for targets between one and 1.5 meters away. And now it can design for targets between 0 0.5 and three meters. And you might be wondering why this thing on the left has this shape. So like if you look at the edges, um, like the bottom right, for example, where you're designing for a target that's eight meters by with a height of one meter, um, the reason performance there is so bad is because the aspect ratio is very extreme. So you're designing a target that's really, really narrowly wide and or really, really not tall, but very wide. And it, you know those are very, very complicated surfaces. So because I'm only using 14th order spherical harmonics, there's no way to actually describe a surface that complicated. And so you, you lose light. If you wanted to, you can see there's actually like the aspect ratios I'm capable of designing for is roughly around an aspect ratio of three. And then once you go beyond that, it's too complex of a surface to describe. So you would need higher order polynomials to actually design for that. So that's ending the, the most of my reasonable part of the talk. Um, this last bit is probably just outside of the scope of optics, but it's what I'm working on now and something that I'm very interested in. So uh, let's go back to the design problem. And we're trying to again, find this subset of the design parameters that are good, where they have good performance. And I'm just going to claim, which is true, there's some function G, which maps points from the entire design parameter space to just the good region. So we were kind of sampling this before um, when we did our optimization by optimizing each independent, independent point. So G, we're sampling it by the trajectory we would take when we optimize our point. And so what we would like to do is if we can find in general what this function G is, we can just generate systems within the desired performance parameters automatically. And then we've solved the design problem in a general sense. So there's two ways to solve this. The first is we can optimize a bunch of discrete points and then sample G from the result. And this is what we did before, right? We, we filled our database with a bunch of random points, optimized them, and then the resulting density of points in space allowed us to sample what the good, good design parameters look like. So that's one approach. The second approach is to generate some function G, optimize this function globally, and then sample discrete points from the result. So you have some function G and you're going to iteratively change this function. So, you know, you start with the entire space and you kind of decrease it until you eventually end up with this functional representation that will produce points within the good design parameters. So here's a loop of how you would do that and what that might look like. So step one is you pick a finite boundary in the design space or 
your initial G and how it's mapping. Um, step two is you perform an evaluation step. So you generate random points from the function G because you need to, to discreetly evaluate them and you check their performance. The third step is you threshold the data. So out of all of the points that you evaluated, you delete some that don't meet your specific performance criteria. So you've gone from a large amount of data to some smaller representation of your data that will have higher performance. So we've condensed our data in one step towards this higher performance. So we've shrunk G so that it produces better performing um, systems. Uh, the next step is kind of dubious, and we'll get to that in a second, where if you keep shrinking your data, eventually you're going to run out of points because you're just deleting points um, that don't work. You know, If you keep shrinking step three, you're not going to have any data there. So we need to find some way to repopulate this database so we don't lose data as we keep shrinking. Um, and then you, know, you take step four and you keep repeating this process. You're going to keep shrinking down until you end up on focusing on just a high-performing final uh, subset of the space. And I'm going to show a demo of how this works before I say how it works, because hopefully it seems like it'd be more clear in this case. So for this example, we're going to design lens triplets. We, we've used this example a lot. It's an 11 dimensional design parameter space. And we're just going to look at ray tracing. So our performance parameter space is just the, the size of the blur at each point. And so we're going to start with a uniform distribution of points at some preset. Um, I can't plot 11 dimensional data, so I'm just plotting a two dimensional slice. And the X and Y axis here is the optical power or one over the radius, radius of curvature for each surface on the second lens. So I'm pretty sure the X axis is the power on the first side of the lens and the Y axis is the power on the second side of the lens. So you can see when I started with, I'm sampling between values of negative 0.02 and 0.02 for power on the second lens, and then kind of uniformly for all the rest of them. I just can't show them all. Um, you can see the starting performance is quite bad. Um, they're kind of spraying light everywhere. Um, the imaging is not good. And so we, we ray trace all of these points, um, and then we get rid of all of the poor perform performing points, and then we repopulate the database so we don't lose precision. And so if we keep doing this, you can see the data size has shrunk and the performance is getting better. Like these are kind of imaging more, they're imaging better than the other ones were. So, and we're doing this, we're looking at smaller and smaller subregions of the design space that, you know, you can see here, we're almost perfectly imaging. Um, and I stopped here and these are very close to meeting the imaging condition. And so by doing this, we've in some sense solved the design problem. And the crux of this method lies in our ability to repopulate the database. And to do this, we need a density estimation of our data distribution. So we need some way to, from discrete points, find a continuous representation and add more data there. And there's a lot of approaches to do this. The way I used is called flow-based density estimation. So we have this subregion, this X prime sub n, that we want to represent using a continuous function. And we want to have this function map uh, our desired density estimation to a well-behaved distribution. In this case, um, you could use anything you want. In this case, I used a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian. So uh, I don't know if this isn't exactly the equation, but with a single Gaussian, it's e to the negative x squared. In two dimensions, e to the negative x squared um, plus y squared. So in n dimensions, your Gaussian is going to be e to the negative, the summation over all your dimensions squared. So that, that's the form there. And what we want to do is have this function transform our discrete data into a continuous representation that we know. So we're taking our discrete data and mapping it to a continuous Gaussian. And the goal here is so that we can take new points from this continuous Gaussian and sample them, take the inverse of this function. So now we have a continuous data. And it seems a bit outlandish that you might be able to do this, but to do this, you only need two things. You need an invertible function and a tractable Jacobian determinant. So there are many different ways um, you can construct a function to do this. Um, this function is one of them. And so our input design parameter space is an 11 dimensional design space. 
So what we do is we use these invertible affine coupling layers. And to do that, we partition our data into two regions. So um, we take the first six points, so from x to 1 to d, in this case, d is 6. And we send those through the top half of this function. We take the rest of those points and send it into the bottom half of this function. And so what this function is, is we have two neural networks for each step. So these are neural networks are going to train and they take as input one partition of the data and they use that partition of the data to generate these scaling and translation um, factors, this T and S. And we use this T and S to modify the other part of the data according to the function e to the s plus t. So um, th this first term y in the bottom right, y d plus 1 to n, is equal to x d plus 1 to n times e to the s plus t, which is actually pretty straightforward. And so we can actually look at this and see how easy the inverse is to calculate because we can just invert it. So if y is equal to x times e to the s plus t, x is equal to y minus t divided by e to the s or multiplied by e to the negative s. So we now have a function that has a very easy inverse. Um, the next step is we want a tractable Jacobian determinant because we're trying to map one density to another. We need some way to make sure that we're conserving areas during this process. Otherwise, we're just going to map all of it to one point. And if, if the Jacobian determinant collapses to a point, then your function is no longer invertible. Um, so we want a Jacobian determinant that we can calculate easily to make sure it doesn't collapse to a point. And so if we look at the Jacobian matrix for this function, um, I, I've kind of drawn it kind of fancy here, but it's a lower triangular Jacobian matrix because the X of 1 to D, if you look at just the neural network on the left, um, just that function, the X of 1 to D is unchanged completely during that process. So the Jacobian determinant is a two-dimensional matrix of the derivatives of the outputs with respect to the inputs. Well, if the output is equal to the input, um, the Jacobian matrix is going to just be ones along the diagonal. So I've shown here in the top left, this ID is the identity matrix um, that is D, it's like D by D identity matrix, basically saying you have ones along the diagonal up until D because you haven't changed that data at all. Um, and then the rest of the data from D plus one to N um, y sub d plus 1 to the n with respect to x sub d plus 1 to the n, um, the only thing there is e to the s because t is a constant. So if you take the derivative, you're just going to get e to the s along that diagonal. So we, we have a, a matrix. The top right is all zeros. And then the diagonal is 1s until you get to d, and then it's e to the s. And it's a property of um, triangular matrices that their determinant is just the product along the diagonal. So the determinant of this matrix can be calculated actually very straightforwardly as just multiplying by multiplying all these e to the s terms together or just adding their exponents the same way. So now we have the two properties we want. It's invertible, it is a tractable Jacobian determinant, and we could just kind of stack a bunch of these layers together to get complicated behavior that we want because the determinant of the entire chain is the product of each individual determinant. So we take each one of these neural networks, calculate the determinant of that step, and then multiply them together for the entire chain. And the same thing for the inverse. We can invert each step in series to get the inverse of the entire function. So now we have a function that maps our desired density to a Gaussian. And we want to train, because this whole thing is, in, you know, in a sense, one large neural network. We want to train some function to do this mapping. So we actually optimize directly for the log likelihood that our transform data is a Gaussian. And the likelihood, th there's a lot there, but essentially you just plug your data into a Gaussian and you ask the question, what is the probability that this data came from a Gaussian distribution? Um, you can see there the loss um, is the log of e to the negative yn. So you just plug your points in. Um, and then we also have the log determinant because we want to make sure our data doesn't collapse to a point. And because of, oh, I have these graphs here. So that's the log likelihood. Yeah. And because of the nice properties of this function we've constructed, um, when you take the natural log of the exponential function, you just get whatever was in the exponent. And the same thing for our determinant was an exponential. So our loss is actually just a sum over the output points, or really just their kind of distance from the origin. 
um, and then a sum over these s terms. And that's all it is. So you, you just optimize a function to minimize this loss, and it'll map our desired distribution discreetly to a Gaussian. And Gaussians are very well behaved. We know how to sample points from them. So we can use that to generate new points in our output domain uh, to refill it. And so kind of going back to our example, um, it should hopefully make a little bit more sense what we're doing now. So we start with a continuous representation. We ray trace all of these points. We throw out the bad ones. We train a neural network to refill these points so we don't lose precision. And that's this step. And then we do it again. And then we do it again. And then we do it again. And so we found a way to keep condensing the data. But because we're refilling it using this neural network representation, we're not losing precision. And it, you know you can see it works pretty well. So that's the end of the talk, actually. Um, I'll get to my acknowledgments acknowledgments now. If you have any questions, feel free to leave comments or send me an email, uh, read my papers. There, there's a lot more information here than I was able to explain just in the talk because um, I don't like going too much into like the complicated math for presentations because it's less exciting. But throughout this process, uh, my advisor Ron, Lang, Ron Liang has been very, very helpful through all of this. Um, you can see I went through a whole bunch of different topics throughout my PhD research and he was trusting enough to let me kind of explore some of these really strange ideas. Um, but throughout the entire time, he was also, he was knowledgeable enough to tell me, Caleb, that's probably a bad idea. Don't spend time looking into that. So he was really helpful in just focusing me on things that would potentially be good. Um, probably most of you don't know this, but I've been really, really sick for the last one and a half years of my PhD. So a huge thanks to my girlfriend who helped me through all of this. Um, you know, took me to the hospital in the middle of the night, made sure I was still breathing at some times, um, helped me. So it was because of mold, and I, I plan on making a video explaining my entire process, but mold poisoning is not a joke. Jenna helped me through that. Thank you. Um, John Koshal and Jose Sassian, they served as committee members for my dissertation defense. So a huge thank you for that. Um, I had taken radiometry before with John, uh, before I came to grad school, and I hated it. Um, and then I took it with John Koshal and I got excited about it enough to the point where, you know, I focused about one third of my research time on it. Um, and then Jose, I read his book a lot throughout my PhD. Um, it's the clearest description of optical design that I could find, so I strongly recommend it. Brian Anderson is one of the best teachers I've ever had, and his quantum class got me interested in pursuing math. I actually did not have a strong math background at all before I started grad school. And then I took his quantum class my first year or first semester, and I got very excited about math, and that's, um, I'm building up a, a good background in math now. Huge thanks to Paul Leister. He was an incredible undergrad professor who mentored me. He actually let me do research in his lab and kind of my first conference presentation was because of him. And I think a large part of that is why I got into grad school. So shout outs to him. And then I'm sure there are tons of other exceptional professors, students and role models um, throughout this that I'm forgetting or missing. So thank you to everyone who's helped me. And my family was really great through all this. So thank you guys. And then Obviously funding, um, I was funded by the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, so that gave me kind of financial stability and freedom to look at all of these complicated things. Thank you.